Sky Howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. Yeti Yeti, standing guard up there. And of course, right over here next to him. Sushi the Adventure Dragon, freshly back from a visit over to the gaming store where they all want to play with him and adore him. And they were busy painting miniatures and somebody had some space marines. And Sushi got down on the table and checked them out and decided that they were in fact dangerous and attacked them. But yeah, there you go. This grinning Teddy Yeti. Teddy Bear with Yeti mask on. Garden the porch. Hey, okay, we're at the Dollar Tree. We did a little walk around. Beautiful weather. I mean, this is the beginning of October here in Montana. And uh, it's still like absolutely gorgeous. This is the local neighborhood. You see some chemtrailiness up there in the sky. Get on that, Maha. <laughs> Yep, little business district here. The car dealership over there. Flower dispensary is something that you do not see in most states because it is legal here. And not only for medicinal but also for recreational. Which does not cause any spike in crime or anything. Here we go. Let's go find out. Local vendors. It's a vendor stand. They're actually from a neighboring state selling ripe peaches. Not your average panhandler. How does this date find you, sir? Captain Jack, how did you find yourself so far inland? You got shipwrecked a long ways from the coast, let me put it that way. It's so serene home, I can tell you, that's for sure. Well, uh, that would be pretty much typical for this area. Hey, uh, my buddy with me here is a big fan of you. Can I get a little video of you? And then I can give you something for your rump. Absolutely. Hold on. Oh my god, it's a bearded dragon. Yes. Hello, my friend. Hello, what is it? He's very his, famous. His name? This is Sushi the Bearded Dragon. Oh my god, you go to it. <laughs> the retro, don't you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I am very yep. familiar with Sushi. It's sushi the, the Bearded Hello. Dragon. Hello, he is beautiful. <laughs> I like him. He's super friendly and, of course, being an actual dragon, he is a huge fan of piracy. I see. However yes. much gold you can get, whatever it takes to get it and he's gonna get a big pile and lie on it. I'm sure he has quite the <laughs> He's quite the attention hog. I believe it. I mean, oh, he attracts quite the number of items. All right, well, let me help you with your problem. I don't have any money handy right now, but I do happen to have a bottle right, of Captain Morgan. I will so take you're it. Set thank, for you, thank you. All right. <laughs> and then here's sushi. And I'll take sushi back again. You have Th yourself a thank wonderful Thank you very much. Day. Have a great day. Thank you. So, yep, you meet interesting people all over the place here. And, uh, panhandlers, travelers, pirates that were somehow kidnapped by sorcery and dumped way too far inland. Just all sorts of strange things. Something you don't see every day. Giant cow for a billboard. Next interesting sight down the line. How cool is that? See what it says? There's your gate. It automatically closes. Everything's all fenced up. Nice and secure, you'd think it was friggin' Treasure Island or something, the way they got this place staked out.
Hope we all can see this. Giant open space in here. Yeah, I figured since uh, I ran into a pirate, maybe come down and check out the island here. pirate and whatnot down on the island and I figured I would read you guys a section from Ron Moorhead's book Quantum Bigfoot chapter 15 invisibility quote in a time not distant it will be possible to flash any image formed in thought on a screen and render it visible at any place desired the perfection of this means of reading thought will create a revolution for the better in all of our social relations." Unquote. Nikola Tesla. So why does it surprise us when we hear that something can become invisible? Maybe it's because so much of our understanding of this world comes to us through our eyes. Sometimes if we say, I see, it usually means you understand. In this chapter we'll discuss two types of invisibility, i.e. classical and Quantum. Professor John Pendry, physicist and winner of the prestigious Newton Medal, the highest honor of the UK's Institute of Physics, Pendry first published an idea for an invisibility cloak in 2006. In 2013, he discussed invisibility cloak technology at the Imperial College in London, metamaterials, and the science of invisibility. He's a professor of theoretical solid state physics there. This is a fairly new technology in the works. As we know, light can bend when going through a sphere, even through water. However, Dr. Pendry's idea is more subtle. Going through a material where light is bent gradually around an object that is covered with the metamaterial that he speaks of. In order to make an object no longer visible, it's necessary to bend or channel the light around it in such a way that what the viewer sees is what stands behind the object rather than the object itself. This gives the impression of being able to see through it. In July 2016, scientists at Queen Mary University of London may have made an object disappear by using material with nano-sized particles that can enhance specific properties on the object's surface. For the first time, researchers demonstrated a practical cloaking device, quote, that allows curved surfaces to appear flat to electromagnetic magnetic waves, unquote, according to the university. The researchers used a nanocomposite medium to coat a curved surface around the size of a tennis ball. Project co-author Professor Yang Hao said, The design is based on transformation optics, a concept behind the idea of the invisibility cloak. Queen Mary University of London Media News 2016 reports, quote, Researchers have been able to quantify fundamental physical limitations on the performance of cloaking devices, a technology that allows objects to become invisible or undetectable to electromagnetic waves, including radio waves, microwaves, infrared, and visible light. The researchers' theory confirms that it is possible to use cloaks to perfectly hide an object for a specific wavelength, but hiding an object from an illumination containing different wavelengths becomes more challenging as the size of the object increases." Unquote. SourceCrystalLinks.com author, of course, in this case, Ron, says many of these studies fall into the realm of classical science, but for years I've heard people refer to something a bit different. They saw a Bigfoot disappear, actually cloak, in front of their eyes. 
For years I discounted these accounts until I began to look into quantum physics and began to understand to some degree how this could actually happen. It's all about frequency, electrons, and waves. There's something called human involuntary spontaneous invisibility in which someone disappears without explanation. Unlike classical science, it's about shifting vibrational frequency. Donna Higby says human invisibility has been written about for centuries. Indo-European and pre-Aryan shamanistic beliefs accompanied the peoples who eventually migrated into the Indus Valley, approximately 2500 to 1500 BC. Here men and women of great spiritual attainment, superior knowledge and extraordinary power came to be called rishis. The Vedas, which form the basis of Hinduism, emanated from the teaching of the rishis beginning about 1000 BC. In these texts we find description of the rituals and techniques of the Hindu priest, sounding very much like the magical and shamanistic abilities of sorcerers, magicians, and shamans. Later in Hinduism, around 700 to 300 BC, we find secret doctrines called the Upanishads, which were written for students. Within these, there is a section called the Yoga, yoga Yogat, Yogat Atpa, which gives the rich mystical philosophy of the discipline and theory of practice for attaining knowledge of the essence of God. A serious student of Raja Yoga was taught that certain supernatural, supernormal powers, called cities, were a natural outcome of gaining mastery over one's mind and environment and were used as valuable indications of the student's spiritual progress. One of these yogic cities was human invisibility. Patanjali, the author of Yoga Sutra, which is one of the earliest treatises among the early Indian writings, attempts to describe the process whereby human invisibility occurred. He says that concentration, excuse me, <coughs> concentration and meditation can make the body imperceptible to other men, and a direct contact with the light of the eyes no longer exists, the body disappears. The light engendered in the eye of the observer no longer comes into contact with the body that has become invisible, and the observer sees nothing at all. There's not a lot written about how this occurs. The explanation of the process whereby invisibility <coughs> was brought into being was most likely left up to the teacher to impart to the student. century on, numerous texts in Europe refer to similar abilities performed by sorcerers and magicians who had the power to make themselves invisible like the shamans, both ancient and modern, and the yoga masters in India. Some other cultures in which shamanism and the ability to vanish has played a major role are the aborigine of Australia, the archaic people of North and South America, and the people in the polar regions. Rosicrucianism began in Europe in the 15th century. Among the papers of that time, there are a number of them that talk about invisibility. A brother in the Rosicrucian fraternity wrote a paper on how to walk invisible among men, and there is evidence that this was being taught in those early days. H. Spencer Lewis, the founder of the ancient and mystical order Ros A. Crucis in San Jose, California, stated that one can gain invisibility with the use of clouds. He says that clouds, or bodies of mist, can be called out of the invisible to surround a person and thus shut him out of the sight of others. According to Lewis, this secret practice is still taught in the mystical schools of today. The written literature on this subject supports the statement that the cloud is the basis of the Rosicrucian invisibility secret. John Mackey was an early Masonic leader. The early Masons were believed to be an offshoot of the Rosicrucians. He taught a method whereby any man could render himself invisible. Another offshoot of the Rosicrucian fraternity, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, left manuscripts describing the ritual of invisibility. These manuscripts talk about surrounding yourself with a shroud, which is described as looking, quote, like a cloud. It is said that Madame Blavatsky, dogs running around down by the water, Madame Blavatsky of the Theosophical Society witnessed this invisibility for herself 
and was actually given the secret thereafter accomplishing this for herself on several occasions in front of witnesses. The literature on the spiritualists in the U.S. shows that there is no doubt they too knew about the cloud and its creation. What is this cloud? We're looking for something that is between empty space and actual physical matter, something unseen by the naked eye but very much in existence. The Rosicrucian Manual tells us that the first form into which spirit essence concentrates preparatory to material manifestation is electrons. When spiritual essence gathers into very minute focal points of electrical charge due to certain conditions, we have the creation of electrons. Science reports that such a cloud of free electrons will absorb all light entering it. It will not reflect nor refract light waves, nor are light waves able to pass through a human being. Consequently, the observer's eye sees nothing there, and the person surrounded by such a cloud is invisible. Since light is necessary for human sight when there are no reflected or refracted light waves bouncing off a person and hitting the observer's retina, the person is not able to be seen and is not visible under normal circumstances. How is this cloud created intentionally? That is difficult to say. There are references to and descriptions of invisibility and its creation in the writings of secret societies, but most people don't have access to these writings. One could go to India and become an apprentice or a student of an Indian guru or teacher to learn these techniques, but that probably is not practical in modern life. To the everyday person, the knowledge of how invisibility works is a mystery. With spontaneous and voluntary invisibility as possible, the person or people are forming a light-absorbing free electron cloud around themselves. They are doing it unknowingly and without knowledge of the method. Perhaps they are able to master this skill in another reality which is affecting them here, since some kind of focused mental thought process must be employed to make cloud form around oneself, then it might be that these people are doing this unconsciously. Telekinesis is often done unconsciously. People have these invisibility experiences seem to have higher than average psychic abilities. Possibly if they are able to traverse other dimensions and command natural forces, whether knowingly or unknowingly. End of quote. Becoming invisible. With a practice, you can become invisible by learning to spiral your personal grid to a higher frequency. Begin by sitting very still, relaxing, taking long deep breaths. Focus your energy on the electromagnetic energy field, the light field, auric field that surrounds you. Envision the particles in that light field speeding or spiraling upwards so they no longer reflect your, reflect your light and take your time. If you're successful, you'll disappear. The lasting effect, of course, is varying. If this works and you're by yourself, you may have difficulty in proving that it happened to anyone. <clears throat> in Native American legend and First People legends, they also depict invisibility. The following legend was selected because it describes invis invisibility by a Bigfoot. Source is the Oregon Bigfoot Highway, Williamette City Press, 2015. The Clackamas Indians state that for a Bigfoot to become accepted into Bigfoot society as an adult, as a warrior, or as a mature individual, the Bigfoot must present itself in full frontal view of humans three times and not be seen. The implications of this legend are enormous. Some are obvious. For instance, to prove the three unseen experiences, other Bigfoots probably were present to watch the events and were also not seen. Another implication is how they do it. Can they control human minds, or is there a molecular transformation component? These are important present-day questions. By selling their cloaking techniques to the military, our Bigfoot friends could become billionaires and buy their own gated forests. But seriously, and most importantly, to establish a basis on the legend, the Clackamas Indians 
must have repeatedly seen Bigfoot in various attempts to gain mature status. Perhaps they saw Bigfoot young ones or Bigfoot adults with impaired mental ability who were not capable of making themselves invisible, or possibly adults who exposed themselves not knowing a human was watching. Another likelihood is that the Native Americans encountered advanced adolescent Bigfoot attempting invisibility skills, but only saw parts of the creature. Such an event might be very disturbing indeed. But however appearance materialized, the Clackamas Indians believed the creatures were real, and since there is no legend about conflict, we assume that tribe lived in peace and harmony alongside the Bigfoot. So does Bigfoot know of an invisibility techni technique that we have yet to fully understand? Do they know how to change their vibrational frequency to become unperceived by our eyes? Well, we asked them, and uh, how do they become invisible? And they said they bend light around them. <laughs> there you go. <clears throat> yeah. oh, Sushi Meister here. We're going to go over and check out another spot. But first, before we do that, I'll show you guys. shelter. Sun's about to go down. So, time to take a hike back out again. sushi. We're finding structures and stuff down here. And we found that one giant uh, lodge structure that I'm really close to right now. And I'm wondering if somebody's down here using it at night. But people, humans are not allowed on this island after nine o'clock. So I can't get down here to stake it out. But one of my research team members that isn't a human, Sushi the Adventure Dragon, <laughs> volunteered to do a stake out down here and see if he sees anything. So coming to get him. See what he found out. See if anything happened. Looks like he's hiding. Are you taking a nap? What you doing back there? Okay. What did you see last night? Let me know. Give me the report. What'd you see? Damn it, I keep forgetting you can't talk. Sorry about that. I might have to put up a game cam here or something. As long as we're in here. I think it goes way back in there too. This might be a good place to take a break and uh, tell, a, tell a Bigfoot story. Oh, somebody's shooting. 
Well, Sushi wasn't able to give me much of a report. But, um, I think it would be, uh, I can give you guys a report. Lauren Coleman, Bigfoot Apes in America. He's got a whole bunch of interesting retro stuff in here. And there's like two or three. High strangeness. <clears throat> That's everything. Not to everything about Bigfoot is, let's say, straightforward. Run re one reason is that people tend to use Bigfoot as the canvas for their own fears, which in some cases is darkness incarnate. If you open this door a bit, the shadows come rushing in. To encounter a Bigfoot is to die. This early belief grew out of the one often told story by John Green, who, in writing about the Ruby Creek incident, mentioned that for an Indian to see a Sasquatch was believed to be bad luck. In fact, the observer was in danger of dying. Then Ivan Sanderson propelled the If You See a Bigfoot, You Die legend into the lore of the field within a short passage in his book, Abominable Snowmen, Legend Come to Life. I'll have to read that to you guys sometime. I got that one. In which he refers to the primary witnesses in the Ruby Creek incident, the Chapmans. Quote, It is just as well that we crossed the Fraser River just when we did, and so met the Chapmans because about a month afterward there were drone crossing at the same spot late one night. The irony and tragedy of this event upset me greatly. The Chapman family at the time of the incident consisted of George and Jean Chapman and three children. Then in early 2002 rumors spread on the internet that Patterson died not long after his encounter. Or those who were involved with the Skookum cast might be star-crossed after the deaths of Dr. Leroy Fisher and Dr. Grover Krantz. Is there any reality to this sense of bad luck and death after seeing one? I don't think so. The Patterson-Gimlin film footage was taken in October 1967 when Roger Patterson died in January 1972, more than four years later. The Skookum cast was found in 2000, and Fisher and Krantz died in 2002. The Chapmans had their sighting in 1941 and died in 1959, 18 years later. Nevertheless, the folklore lives on. Writing in Salon in 2001, former Bigfoot researcher Kyle Mizukami wrote, quote, In my time investigating the hairy linebacker, I expended most of my efforts researching Native American legends about the creature. Many tribes believed in a Bigfoot-type being, and many agreed that to see Bigfoot was a bad sign. Often, someone who actually witnessed Bigfoot would have a run of bad luck, go insane, grow sick, or even die. I've always believed that these legends, no matter how fantastic they sounded, had some grains of truth to them. However, the belief of bad luck associated with Bigfoot, while consistent across multiple tribes, was a little too out there, a little too metaphysical for my liking. I wanted facts, not superstition. I didn't know what to do with the bad luck aspect of the legend, so I ignored it and eventually forgot about it. Bad idea. Ironically, by ignoring the bad luck theme, I had ignored perhaps the most personally relevant fact about Bigfoot of all. All the talk. All that talk of seeing Bigfoot, figuratively or otherwise, as being a bad luck sign turned out to be true. It's a scarlet bee in action, viewed through the lenses of another culture. It's dozens of ancient cultures collectively sending the warning, Hey, don't get involved with Bigfoot. You will so regret it. The warnings were in plain view, 
and I completely missed them. The theme of Mizukami's article is that his association with, with Bigfoot has ruined his social life and no one will take him seriously anymore. Mizukami, of course, only extends this folklore into the modern world through his magical thinking. Bigfoot is more than a creature of the wild. It is often what people want to make of it, and it was especially so during one recent period of high strangeness, which of course is the 1960s. Stainer. This man was obsessed with something else, media attention and celebrity. His brother, Stephen Seven, was kidnapped on December 4, 1972. Search parties and news reports <clears throat> did not lead to Stephen, and he remained missing for seven years. The media storm that erupted when Stephen reappeared was intense for the quiet Mormon family, especially for the father, Delbert, and his once missing son, as is clearly portrayed in the 1989 made-for-TV docudrama, I Know My First Name is Stephen. Stephen Stainer died on September 15, 1989, when somebody hit and ran his motorcycle shortly after the film was completed. On December 27, 1990, Carl Stainer's uncle Jesse was found murdered in Merced in his home. He shared with Carol Carrie Stainer. That murder remains unsolved. Then on Valentine's Day weekend of 1999, Carrie Stainer went on a killing spree. Later that year, he was arrested for murder, charged with killing three Yosemite Park tourists and a ranger. The tourist victims, Carol's son, 42, her daughter, Julie, 15, both of Eureka, and Silvina Peloso, 16, an exchange student from Argentina, were guests at the Yosemite Lodge where Stainer worked. Stainer is now serving a life sentence in federal prison for killing the Yosemite Park guide, Joy Ruth Armstrong. Later in 2002, he was found guilty of three tourist murders as well. Now, Stainer used Bigfoot as his lure to approach and talk with Armstrong. Soon after his arrest, Stainer freely discussed his Bigfoot ploy in an art interview with San Jose television newsman Ted Rollins. Stainer was no longer in his dead brother's shadow, and Stainer kept telling anyone he could about Bigfoot. He told of his sighting to the cab driver on his ride home the February night he says he dumped the bodies of the Yosemite tourists. Stainer talked about Bigfoot with everyone. Stainer even imitated the call of the Bigfoot for reporter Sean Flynn, who wrote a January 2000 article in Esquire on the killings. A horrible shriek, Carrie tells me, animated now, eyes flashing, reveling in the memory, like a woman screaming through a bullhorn right next to the car. And it went on for a long time. And then it faded away to this low growl. During Stainer's 2002 trial for the death of the three tourists, defense witness Dr. Jose Arturo Silva testified that Stainer would often visit Foresta, a town on the southwest edge of Yosemite National Park, where Stainer believed he encountered a large, hairy, human-like creature and also decapitated nature guide Joy Armstrong. Silva detailed a long history of mental disorders as the 40-year-old motel handyman's attorney tried to bolster the insanity defense. He lives in a quasi-magical reality, which involves Bigfoot and premonitions about the end of the world, Silva told Stainer's jury. Bigfoot links were all over the Yosemite story, even beyond the Stainer angle. Of the early prime suspects in the murders, one was a member of the Modesto Cranksters, which are local druggies, named Michael Larrick. Larrick's family lived at Long Barn, and half a mile north of Long Barn is where authorities had found Carol's son's burned-out car and two of the three bodies. Michael Lark was later cleared of the murder charges due to Stainer's confession, but he remained in jail in 2002 on drug and weapon charges. Meanwhile, his father, Leroy, had appeared on national television documentaries and in local news reports as a Bigfoot eyewitness. In 68, he claimed to have seen and filmed a Bigfoot near Highway 108, not far from Yosemite. Leroy and Bob James of Tulane snapped three Polaroid prints from a plane above the ridge, which is today named Monster Ridge. Later today, they found two 20-inch footprints that drew a good deal of media attention. Lark and James were famous for a while, neighbor Lance Johnson says. In fact, I think they even went on some big TV shows to talk about it. All the kids at Michael Lark's school talked about it, of course, giving the son his 15 minutes of fame. The Lark family was a celebrity. Michael Lark's claim to fame as a lad was that he was the son of the man who had gotten Bigfoot on film, observed author Carlton Smith. It's been said that Michael may even have searched for Bigfoot in Yosemite, just like Stainer. 
or perhaps more correctly, both have used Bigfoot to cover their sinister activities in the Yosemite area. None of this means that they did not see Bigfoot, however. And speaking of sinister activity in Yosemite, Yosemite, it should be noted, has its own dark side. During the Yosemite Indian War of 1851, mountain man Jim Savage would discover the Yosemite Valley and name it after a word he thought meant grizzly bear. <clears throat> but as Carlton Smith points out in Murder in Yosemite, Savage got confused about the origins of the word Yosemite. It had nothing to do with bears, but referred to a shadowy group of people that pursued the Indians that lived in the valley. The Miwok word Yosemite is really tied to the characterizations of their elusive enemies and means some among them are killers. Stories of violent Bigfoot do exist. Giant cannibals in the bush eating women are part of ancient Indian lore, although little discussed today. One of the first stories among non-natives appeared in Theodore Roosevelt's The Wilderness Hunter, published in 1890. During the mid-1800s, two hunters, one named Bauman, were camping in the Bitterroot Mountains on the other side of the Rockies from Yosemite. Uh, Bitterroots are right there, about a mile away when they were visited by something that left giant footprints. Then at midnight they saw in the fire's light a huge upright form and smelled it too. The next morning Bauman went to check traps and while his mate packed up. When Bauman returned he found his friend's neck broken and four great fang marks in his throat. Roosevelt added, the footprints of the unknown beast printed deep in the soft soil told the whole story. His monstrous assailant which must have been lurking in the woods waiting for a chance to catch one of the adventurers unprepared, came silently up from behind, walking with long, noiseless steps, and seemingly still on two legs. It had not eaten the body, but apparently had romped and gamboled around it in uncouth and ferocious glee, occasionally rolling it over and over, and then it had fled back into the soundless depths of the woods. <clears throat> there are also reports of eastern Bigfoot killing dogs, but when we got a flap of sightings, Let's go find that one, because it has something to do with my shirt. <laughs> From the same podiums in Ohio and Texas in recent years, and he's still talking as if it all happened yesterday. Crabtree, whom I sincerely like, may not admit it, but the movie, more than the monster, changed his life. He never saw the folk monster, but he made a career out of lecturing about the movie. The movie also created a whole new generation of dedicated Bigfoot hunters. Young people between the ages of 10 and 13 who were first attracted to Bigfoot research in the 1970s speak of the legend of Boggy Creek as the source of their passion on the subject. In 1988, Big Footnotes, Daniel Perez wrote, My personal interest in monsters was first ignited at about the tender age of 10 by the movie The Legend of Boggy Creek. This was the trigger which led to casual to casually serious to serious full-fledged involvement in the subject matter. Maryland Bigfoot reference guide author Mark Opsesnik notes that the movie inspired his interest in Bigfoot at the age of 11. Ditto for cryptozoology artist Bill Rebsam, who told me I was about 10 years old when I saw it. I went immediately to the library the next day and checked out all the books I could find on Bigfoot after seeing the movie. And Chester Moore Jr., Texan outdoor journalist and author of Bigfoot South, writes, Seeing the legend of Boggy Creek lit my interest in the Bigfoot phenomenon. 
into a full-blown passion. While the Pacific Northwest seemed to whirl away to me, Arkansas did not. The impact it had on me as a youngster was immense. Meeting people in the current organization, the Texas Bigfoot Research Center, TBRC, including Monica Rollins, Robert Dominguez, Tim Clay, Rick Hayes, and Jerry Heastead told me that they had seen the movie in their youth and it had been the one thing that brought them into the field. TBRC director Craig Woolheater said, It sealed the deal for me. The Legend of Boggy Creek was also the entry point for crypto fiction author Lee Murphy and for Chad Austin, president of Interactive Pilot, Inc. A smash hit, The Legend of Boggy Creek spawned two sequels, Return to Boggy Creek, 1977, and Boggy Creek 2, The Legend Continues, 1985. And thus the latter is actually the third movie, although the second from Pierce, who made The uh, Legend Continues, not the other one. Following in the footprints of Pierce's movie, Creature from Black Lake, was filmed at Caddo Lake, and I was just talking to somebody that's there, <laughs> like about 15 minutes ago, as was The Legend of Boggy Creek, Creature from Black Lake was about a group of men searching for Bigfoot in nearby Louisiana. Sasquatch, The Legend of Bigfoot, 1978, with great footage from the Three Sisters Wilderness in Oregon, was patterned after The Legend of Boggy Creek, mixing allegedly real-life incidents with scary scenes of Bigfoot attacking people. This era of Bigfoot movies is capped with the capture of Bigfoot, 1979, where we find a town that has exploited Bigfoot for tourist dollars, upset by a local businessman who hopes to trap Bigfoot once and for all so he can make the big bucks all at once. The film was a box office disaster. The image of Bigfoot in these motion pictures harks back to women kidnapping upright hairy beasts in the Yeti movies, but with a twist. These Bigfoot are even more violent. From Bigfoot through all the Boggy Creek movies and clones, one finds a decidedly vicious, aggressive Bigfoot. This cinematic Sasquatch only slightly reflects what was actually happening around the country with real Bigfoot reports during the time of my strangeness. Bigfoot, especially in the Pacific Northwest, continued to be mostly reported in nonviolent encounters and through footprint finds. Bigfoot may scare people at the movies, but not really so much in the woods or near their country homes. Nor, it should be noted, did the Hollywood Bigfoot movies lead to a rash of real Boggy Creek type creature sightings in most places in America. So there you go, there's the backstory of the legend of Boggy Creek. Yeah. Say hi, sushi.
are you doing here? I didn't leave you there. Have you come to save me, or have I come to save you? Not many times you find sushi a bearded dragon in a ghost town. You're gonna save me, right? I've got rum. There are things you want to tell me, but you can't say. So, we're gonna do what I want to do. Because I don't know if I can trust you yet. Nope! have a lot of things to work out apparently. So, what I want to do. Now, stay. And let's find a way out of here. Oh my. I'm so sorry, Susie. Rambunctious, aren't you? Alright, I'll hold you. Sit on my shoulder. Now, that way you go. Kind of important. I have a way. Well, it was only a few moments later when I ran into Captain Jack again for the second time. I had been up at Coloma for about fifteen minutes, and well, I noticed that Sushi wandered off somewhere, and I guess that's when Captain Jack ran into him. He seemed fairly happy to be getting rid of him and let me carry him again. And he was still looking for a way to get back to the Black Pearl, being hopelessly lost, and now even further from where I found him the first time. So I told him I knew there was a portal nearby, and uh, that I would help him get out of there if he would help me do some Bigfooting. So he agreed. And it was then that I brought up that I had found this really weird compass box down on the island the day before clearly magical, and that if you took the magic compass with you and went up to where the two standing stones were, there's a portal there. And all you have to do is just knock three times on the stone, and the portal will open and take you back to the Black Pearl. But I also reminded him that he can't keep the magic compass. He has to bring it back to me, or it will bring him back to me. There's the outline of the foot. Back up there. How big is it? Just a little bit bigger than my foot is. So, about 14. And that's an old one. Let's see if we can find something a little bit fresher here. Am I the only one that sees this? Still there. What made that? Don't go that way. No, not enough room. up here and there's the impact mark here's where the heel came down crushed the ground and that's uh, not the imprint of a tire because we're past the gate no driving allowed down here and we have what looks like several more of them there's another imprint right here where you got what looks like a heel and then more toe marks up here so if you want to leave that Tape down. Right there, yeah. And once again, looks to be about the same size as the previous one. So we may have had a couple of old prints from Big Toe going downhill here, which wouldn't surprise me because we found his trackway going up that one little ridge down there a few weeks ago near here. 
and uh, as we were coming past the elk gate, me and uh, Captain Jack heard an interesting sound like two trees rubbing together, but there wasn't enough wind to make any trees rub together. So yeah, here we are on the trail of Bigfoot, high in the mountains, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, with the pirate captain who got lost here due to some sort of sorcery or something. He's not so bad, I've got rum. He's got rum. <laughs> Alright, we're going to see if we can go find some more tracks before we run out of daylight here. As you guys can tell, it's sun's trying to go down over there pretty soon. So we'll see what else we can get. Hey, we found a track. You can see where it dug into the hillside up there. Man, man, big compression on the ground there. So, we got another, what, about 15 incher. And that was the same size as the ones we were finding the last time we were down here. So, probably from the same individual. Thank you. Captain Jack for the help holding the instrument of measuring. When in doubt, pinky out. <laughs> this is my way out. Holding the the I can do this. So make sure that you're kind to everyone. Uh, safety first, last, and always. Pay it forward. Don't be mean to people if you don't have to be. Uh, don't flip off the mountain giant. Don't poke dog man with a stick. Don't punt the puckwoogie. And for God's sake, whatever you do, do not hug the Wookiee.